So, when did it all begin? When did you, like, say, listen, I think I want to draw for a living. It's like you had to have that moment with your family, or was it just something you were just doing? Or how to get to that point where you're like, mm, I think that's kind of well, what I want to do. Well, when I was in, uh, well, I was probably in sixth grade, I met my friend Fred Jackson. And Fred started showing me, those like, yeah, I draw my own homemade comics. Uh, and uh, I was just like, wow, really? How do you do that? So, you know, we, we started we started our own little company, you know, Vosberg and Jackson called Voxen. And we would do these little uh, homemade comics and trade them back and forth. Uh, mm. I think that one here someplace that, uh, I mean, they were, they were like, so um, they were kid stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that always amuses me is people would are, will tell young artists, you have to have talent to do this. <laughs> I'll bring in my comics and show them to kids and go, hey, look, there's hope for that kid. There's hope for anybody, you know, because it was, uh, um, we all start someplace. And um, about the same time that I was drawing all my comics with Fred, I had the good fortune to be living in the Detroit area and which was the birthplace of comic book fandom because there was a professor uh, there named Jerry Bales. Jerry was a great guy. Um, and um, he started putting out uh, the fanzine alter ego. And of course I, you know, sent him my, uh, whatever it was, 25 cents or whatever, and, you know, got a copy and, mm -hmm. and immediately got on the phone with him because he was only 20 miles away and, and was asking him, well, how do you do this? I want to do my own fanzine. Um, and he was very helpful. He was always a, you know, a mentor of sorts in that way. Um, and, oh, through my high school years, I was doing one of the very first comic book fanzines called Masquerader. Uh, and by doing that, that, I think I met everybody I was going to work with in the industry for the next 10, 15 years. And this was one of these, one of the little, um, uh, one of the issues. That's uh, so awesome. This, well, this shows you, you know, like this is high tech right here because uh, we were doing it on what they called spirit duplicators, which was as, as kids, that's how we got all our homework. You know, it was, it was a, you know, you just you'd put it, you'd, you'd put it on a master, you'd crank out the number sheet. It lasts about 300 copies. Well, I had three different artists drawing this cover. So I had to like get a master and send it to one. They had to send it to the next person. They had to send it to the next person. At any point, if the post office screwed up, we were dead. You know? Is that um? Is that like the machine with the drum? And when you would do it, it would spin around. Yeah. We called it a ditto machine, but I go, it definitely evolved over the years. Yeah, and yes. and you had to be careful when you were putting on that master because if you didn't get it on right, it mm -hmm. would you know crinkle. So if you had a drawing yep. like that. You could ruin it so easily. Oh my gosh, kids! You don't know. It's so funny because this is all pre, you know, like copy machines. So now we have scanners in our house now. But just the idea that you know, you're so right. I remember the Ditto machines. Wow, that's crazy to figure out how to line it up. I'm trying to think that through. That's just that's crazy that that's actually what you had to do for like 300 copies. Oops, start again. It's like wow, that's crazy. Well, I didn't have to worry about making more than 300 copies because that was kind of you know that was a print run in those days. Yeah, that's all amazing. So that gets you into high school and that kind of thing. And uh, when you when you were doing that, what was like the family's reaction and stuff? Because I mean, obviously, there's people right now, you know, their kids and whatever. And the internet's kind of made everything so different. People want to really chase, you know, chase their dreams and be creative, be artistic, and all of that. But you know, there's always going to be pushback. What do you what do you say to those kids? What did you go through? What was it like with um, you know mom and dad or family? Be like, eh, you know, Mike, mom you know. and dad. I talked about talent. You know, in terms of having talent, if I had a talent, it was that I had talent. Our parents had supported me. Awesome. So they were always very, you know, my dad was a janitor. He made sure I had access to that, you know, that ditto machine at the school where he worked at. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I mean, you know, it was it was always that kind of thing. I always made sure we had paper to draw on at home, you know. With right. That. Um, and uh, they were very supportive. Teachers, you got to remember, I grew up in a, in um in a car town in, a, in Pontiac, Michigan, where, you know, you were, if you were smart, 
Or I was going to say, you know, it's like you're going to start, you were going to work on the line when you got out. If you were smart, you were going to work in the office gotcha. or something related to that. So the idea that I wanted to, you know, that I wanted to draw comics was, was kind of like, I think I'm going to go to Hollywood and become an actor. It was a pipe dream. Sure. What, what made it real for me was in Detroit, I had this whole circle of, of guys that I met through, you know, uh, like I said, in, in, um, um, like Al Milgram and uh, Jim Starlin was one of the first ones I met. He was like, when he was 13, I was like a senior in high school. I remember he hitchhiked out to my house from uh, where he lived in Berkeley, about 20 miles away and said, Hey, I heard you did fanzines, you know? And, uh, um, and I remember, you know, giving him a ride home and we became good friends. And, uh, you know, we were, we were always, you know, like, like doing different things and showing each other. And, When I saw, you know, like a few years later, I mean, I went to, to um, um, you know, after high school, I went to college, got a degree in, in uh, education and uh, English literature and taught school for uh, three years. And during that time, you know, suddenly I saw Jim develop into those artists and he's getting work. And it made it real for me. It mm. made me understand that, oh, wait, this isn't just... Uh, you know, a, a pipe dream that you can do. This is, you can actually try this. Um, and the idea that I was actually going to go forward with that was really youthful arrogance because I had absolutely no conception on how to draw. I know a lot of people still think I don't, but, uh, you know, um, so, I mean, I, I didn't have any of that training in high school. I mean, we had one art course, I think, in high school, and that was basically where they spent, like, the, the discipline problems. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's like, like we had, you know, those guys and then us and, um, you know, it was fun, but, um, and, and the whole concept of storytelling, that was like beyond comprehension for anyone. I mean, in terms of, in terms of, um, of trying to, to, to teach that stuff. And I think actually my English lit, um, degree probably was a lot more helpful to me as a comic book artist than uh, any art class I would have taken. Because it taught me I, I was going to ask you that. It like helps you, it, it definitely broadened your horizons in storytelling, you know, the heroic archetypes, you know, the different, different type of elements that you need to have a decent story. Now you now you kind of know what some of the key elements are. And the other thing for me was I was a big movie fan. I, mm -hmm. I didn't have TV till I was about 12 or 13, but my parents usually took us to, you know, movies on Friday night and we'd see like a, you know, double feature Westerns, cartoons, whatever. And me, that was like going to church. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just like the height of the experience you could have. So I think as a storyteller, um, like I said, my English lit background and movies were far more influential to me than, uh, I read a ton of comics, but my favorite comics were classics illustrated, uh, you know, and, um, uh, geez, what else? Mystery comics, things like that. Um, so, like I said, when I started hanging around with guys like uh, Starlin, Milgram, we had Terry Austin, Arvel Jones, uh, God, who else was in there? Rich Buckler, uh, Tom Orzakowski, the letterer. Um, I mean, we had a slew of Aubrey, uh, Aubrey Bradford. He was a little bit younger than I was. But uh, all these guys came along, and we all fostered each other. I mean, you know, they, we would look at each other's work, give each other, you know, criticism of sorts and encouragement. And uh, if, if one of us, you know, when one of us made it in terms of like, you know, getting work from Marvel or DC or wherever, when you went into the city, they were there to give you a helping hand. It wasn't like, you know, you're on your own. Good luck. I mean, um, it, it, all those guys were really, uh, you know, they were part of kind of a, a family that really. Yeah, sounds uh, like it. Forward.